All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining me today. My name is Andrew Aitken, and I'm the Global Open Source Practice Leader for Wipro. I'm really excited to share this uh, topic with you today. Um, I, I hope that you, each and every one of you is able to take away a, a few tidbits that will allow you to do your open source planning a little bit more efficiently and effectively. Um, so there are obviously a whole bunch of ways to do this, but uh, I wanted to share a, a, a model and an approach that uh, I and my team have developed over the years uh, that, that, is, that really help, hopefully will help you be able to get at some of the, the core decisions pretty quickly. This is not a, a very a detailed, sophisticated uh, uh, approach. Uh, obviously, it's a complex topic. Uh, and there are many, many elements that go into building an enterprise-wide plan. Um, and so we're going to tackle just one aspect of it today, and that's how to leverage open source to help drive some of your key initiatives from a planning perspective. Just a second here, but the slides doesn't seem to want to move. There we go. All right. Uh, so for those of you who may not be familiar with, with Wipro, we are one of the large global systems integrators, around $9 billion in revenue and uh, over 180,000 employees. What's more, more relevant here is we have, a we have a lot of rich, deep experience in, in open source. Uh, coming from hundreds and hundreds of uh, different projects uh, across the globe and across all domains virtually. So I've been in open source for about 22 years now. Uh, I did launch the first uh, open source strategy consulting firm uh, way back when, ran that for 11 years and then uh, sold it to Black Duck Software. Uh, I also uh, launched the Open Source Think Tank, which was uh, an, a biannual event held in Napa, California, and Paris, France, uh, each year where we brought in 120 of the top open source thought leaders to really just kind of brainstorm on how open source was evolving, the opportunities, the challenges, and so on. And have had the opportunity to, to work on a couple of hundred different projects um, for most of the major OEMs and, and ISVs for 20 or 30 different open source and proprietary software startups, and certainly for dozens of large enterprises. So have a pretty, pretty good background on, on the topic here today, and hopefully that, uh, that comes through for you. So <clears throat> why are we talking about building an enterprise-wide open source strategy, uh, especially when enterprises have so many other strategies, whether it's around your digital transformation journey, legacy modernization, moving to the cloud. Uh, well, there is one key factor that underpins all of these, and it is, it is open source. It is the core building block for all these major initiatives that happen today. And so if you're not treating it uh, strategically and planning for it, then that can certainly have uh, a resulting negative impact on some of the other key initiatives in the organization. So another, uh, <clears throat> another way to, to kind of uh, determine why this is important to, uh, to build an open source strategy is around what we hear from your peers. So we've, my team's been very careful over the last couple of years. We've been asking your peers why they're investing in open source, why they stay with open source, why they make more and more commitments to open source. And so this is what we hear from, from our clients. This is not what we say. This is not what analysts say. Um, so open source really does have the ability to drive innovation in the enterprise. Uh, <clears throat> it also allows you to fail fast, which means that you can try something. If it works, that's great. If it doesn't, you can move on quickly uh, with little to no repercussions for doing that. Um, it allows your developers to get productive much faster. We have one client that calls this zero-day productivity. So they've, they've, they've defined that uh, how an open source developer becomes more productive on their open source-based applications versus those that they hire to work on their complex package proprietary software applications. Open source also allows you to 
uh, recruit and retain your best developers, and it can have a very positive impact on your brand and uh, overall reputation. So the, uh, I want to talk about a couple of assumptions that uh, we can make uh, as it relates to, to building an open source strategy. One is at a very, very high industry level, uh, we hear frequently everyone wants to be a tech company, right? And one of my favorite uh, actual taglines from a client of ours, uh, not in financial services, but I, I thought this is pretty interesting, is today we are a wholesome food provider, but tomorrow we want to be a technology company offering innovative protein-centric foods. Um, <clears throat> my view on this is that some, some companies can take this just a little too far. But for those who do, who are trying to make that transformation to becoming more of a technology organization, many of them are calling out open source as one of the key catalysts to help them to do this. So some more direct or relevant assumptions that, that we can make. Uh, today, you are almost guaranteed to be using more open source than you think you are, regardless of whether or not you have a strong governance program. You will probably be using more in the future than you think you will. Uh, today, open source is becoming more of a strategic uh, imperative within your organization as opposed to simply a set of tactical IT component, uh, components in your IT infrastructure. Uh, growing a community is, is hard, and that's not likely to change. Uh, <clears throat> there will always be cost pressures on your organizations and we're all members of what I like to call the Baskin Robbins enterprise. So Baskin Robbins favorite tagline is they have 31 flavors, one for each day of the month. Well, when we get involved with, uh, with uh, large clients, large enterprises, financial services organizations, um, <clears throat> we like to call on this because every line of business, every uh, development group has their own 31 flavors of open source that they want to use, uh, which makes all of our jobs a little bit more complex. So every organization is on an open source journey today. And it's important to understand kind of where you are and the attributes of, of where you are on your journey um, on a maturity curve. Uh, this really helps with the planning exercise. So we're gonna talk about that, uh, identifying that uh, where you are a little bit. So, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a part of being on, uh, on this journey is always about uh, the value you derive from open source versus the amount of effort that you pull in. And this is a model that we've, uh, that, that we've built over the years. It's, it's a, a set of, of buckets uh, of characteristics or attributes um, that we've observed uh, from, from obviously uh, open source is kind of famous for being grounds up or ad hoc. Um, as an organization begins to realize that open source is important, they begin to try and implement some policies and processes. Then they begin to try and spread this across the organization to become a bit more directed and active. Um, the next step is beginning to internally and externally collaborate to, to create business value. And then the last stage is kind of realizing, uh, realization of the full benefits of open source. Their leadership, leadership is involved. There's been a cultural transformation uh, and so on. So it's also important to understand that uh, an enterprise can be on multiple points on this maturity curve or this, or this journey. Uh, frequently, it's the case that when we get involved with, with companies, a <clears throat> one line of business may be farther towards the left, another line of business may be farther towards the right. Uh, and that's just kind of the nature of having a global distributed enterprise today. And so you may need to go through an exercise of identifying where each line of business is, and then helping create kind of a, a lowest common denominator across the organization. <clears throat> so each one of the stages uh, of this maturity curve can be broken down you know, a little bit further into a set of attributes that are associated with, with it. So at the, and, and, and these attributes are broken down by uh, the constituents, the developers, the operational, the support folks, legal, procurement, uh, security, HR, and so on, uh, a set of capabilities, um, 
the, the how value is created in the organization and the overall organizational leadership and, and culture. So, uh, for example, at the ad hoc level, developers are certainly beginning to use more and more open source. Typically, operations at this point are unregulated. Uh, capabilities are very uneven or sporadic across the organization. Um, not really aware of how value is, is actually being created or what that value is. It's uh, typically individual developers that find a cool technology that solves a, a particular problem they have in that moment. Uh, and they're seeing some value, but there's no organizational understanding of how that value is being captured. And, and uh, behaviors uh, tends to be a bit bureaucratic and, and uh, uh, somewhat uh, unreasonable at that point because there's typically a lack, of, a lack of understanding that's going on. So as you move up the maturity curve, you move a little bit farther to the right, the attributes obviously begin to change a bit. Uh, we can talk about the collaboration when you, when you begin to reach that collaboration level. Developers are beginning to work together to co-create value. The operations at that level are tuned. There's probably some sort of uh, automation that's involved. There's detailed uh, processes and policies in the training program and so on. Uh, your developers are becoming more and more skilled. They're active contributors at this point, and, and you can actually see both individually and collectively their skills are growing by being more engaged in open source. Value creation is more in, in, uh, integrated across the organization. Uh, groups are beginning to, to work together more closely to either drive more innovation, to reduce your technology debt, to reduce costs, whatever the focus is. And now we're beginning to, to have a, a culture that's beginning to become more open, transparent, collaborative. Um, and you see, again, more and more executive leadership uh, at this level also. So again, this is, uh, this is a way to look at how to, uh, and to understand where you are on the maturity curve and the certain attributes that are associated with, with each step. So let's get started. Let's, let's spend a, a few minutes on, on going through and, and kind of building a, a sample uh, decision support model for, around uh, open source here. So obviously you have to start with what you're trying to achieve. And here are some common, uh, common aspects of, of open source, uh, of, of what people believe that open source can help them impact, create new revenue models, reduce cost, improve innovation, improve the brand and, and reputation and developer productivity. So it's really important to, to start by trying to understand what are we trying to achieve? And in most organizations, you're trying to achieve one, two, or all of these, right? But we're just gonna go through one today uh, and I'm gonna pick a uh, brand enhancement. One of those kind of squishy things, but we do hear this in almost every engagement we get into today. Our clients want to improve their brand or, or improve their reputation, and they think open source is a way to do so. So, okay, let's talk about why. First thing, problem statement, I've crafted one here. So our customers don't perceive of us as providing modern or innovative banking capabilities. Pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, we have heard these exact words used a few times. Maybe it resonates with some, some of you uh, in the audience today. Uh, so then let's, let's break that down a little bit. <clears throat> and I like to use some very simple root cause analysis uh, models. Uh, very, very simple. But let's say we've gone through that process. We understand, well, actually, we're not that innovative, or we don't have a strong ideation model in, in our, uh, uh, in our techno technology teams. Uh, even if we did, we don't actually have the capability to, technical capability to bring those to market fast enough or effectively. Um, and we feel that uh, either we need to add new people, we don't have the right people, or we need to upskill the current people's resources. So these are the three underlying issues that I've identified for this particular exercise here. Okay. And it's obviously very important at this stage, you have to create a baseline. It, you have to know where you are today. You have to understand, it's, you, and, we, and this is actually fairly common. Um, the more common than we would like is people understand when people come to say, we have to improve our brand. Okay, great, why? We get to these points, by how much, in what areas, across what domains, with what customer segment, so on and so forth. Uh, they don't have the answers. They just know they need to improve their brand. Okay, so 
It's really important that the, at this stage, create a baseline. There are lots of models and methods to do that. Uh, uh, surveys, SEO, a variety of different softwares that'll help, help do this. Whatever, it's important before you go further to understand where you are today. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about how you're going to improve, improve your brand. Pardon me. <clears throat> so how are, you, how are you going to achieve this? Well, there are four levers of open source, okay? One is how you consume open source, how you ingest it, how you acquire it, how you operationalize your use of open source across the organization, that's one. Second is how you contribute, and this is specific to how you contribute back to existing projects. The third one is around publishing. That's simply about open sourcing your own software. And the fourth is what we call embed or using open source development best practices inside the organization. So it's not about the technology, it's about the methods and the approach and how open source, the model of how open source software is actually built. It's commonly referred to as inner source today. So let's go through a, a little bit of an exercise here because we want to start breaking this down a, a little bit, uh, a little bit further. So <clears throat> let's let's uh, let's see if we can apply the levers of, of open source to the core underlying issues that we have uh, that we've identified around helping drive uh, brand uh, uh, enhancement. So when let's talk about <clears throat> for innovation, does consuming software drive innovation inside an organization? Yes, it does a little bit. Uh, sometimes most or many times organizations are simply just consumers of, of packaged or community open source. And so mild effect. Does it help uh, drive technology improvement or enhancement? It certainly can. You know, it doesn't, doesn't mean, you know, ad adopting the, the, the latest uh, relational data, open source relational database is really going to make you innovative. But if you adopt enough open source, uh, new, innovative, modern open source technologies, your overall organization will become more tech technologically competent, we'll say, right? And does consuming open source really uh, help drive the, the growth of, of you, the people category here? It, again, it can, but may not have as, as large an impact if you're just pure consumers. So if you contribute to existing projects, does that help drive innovation? It can. Uh, it may be more tactical contributions than, than really innovative. So yes, no. Uh, can it help improve the technology in the organization? Absolutely. If you're contributing back to existing projects, it typically means that you have developers or contributors who are pretty well versed in these technologies uh, and that um, uh, this can really help uh, again, uplift your, your own technology category here. And can it help drive some of the people goals that you may have tied to brand enhancement? Absolutely. Then we come to publishing. You can see that's fairly strong across all the categories. Obviously, if you open source some of your own software, you're hoping it's innovative, may not always be, but uh, there should be, there's probably some very good reason for open sourcing it. Uh, and that generally innovation is a component of that. Uh, from a technology perspective, absolutely publishing your own software as, as open source in our observation typically means that the organization is beginning to overall increase their technology capabilities. And certainly it, it can enhance some of these, um, uh, the, the, people, uh, the people category here because your people have to be domain, they, they have to be technology experts, they have to be domain experts, they have to be open source experts. So now you're really beginning to, to reach some of those brand enhancement goals that you want to. So <clears throat> last category is embedding or, or inner source. Uh, yes, it can have uh, this. It really does help drive innovation as your organization becomes more collaborative internally. Um, we have absolutely seen this result in increased innovation, not just actual innovation, but pace of innovation. So it certainly can help achieve those goals. From a technology perspective, it's a little bit less about the technology than it is, is about organizational cultural transformation. So a little bit less there, uh, but again, it will have an impact on how your people um, uh, can help drive some of these brand enhancement goals. So 
This is one way to, to look at the, how the levers of open source can meet the, can, can address some of the underlying issues of your overall goal, which in this case is, is brand or reputational enhancement. So one more, one more exercise to go through. But now we, we have this, we have a premise at, at this point, and we're gonna kind of test or, or, uh, the premise a little bit. So now we can say by contributing to existing open source software projects, publishing your own software as open source or embracing inner source, you can address some of your brand image and reputational uh, goals. So this part begins to get much more specific to each and every individual organization. So what I mean by that is, let's look at <clears throat> what each of these, the pros and cons of each of these different open source levers, right? So contributing, well, if you want, there are lots and lots of projects out there that your, uh, that your people can contribute to. It's typically less expensive than some of the other methods to do so. And you likely have more internal resources who can actually contribute to uh, exist, existing open source projects. The con is in this instance, it's really hard to stand out. I mean, just look at, let's just take the CNCF, the, the foundation where Kubernetes resides and, and the whole kind of Kubernetes ecosystem, excuse me. There are hundreds and hundreds of projects in there today. Uh, there are what, over 45 million projects on, on uh, GitHub. Um, so it's, it's not easy to really pick the right project and stand out in that, in that project. Uh, so the impact is, is probably going to be lower. So let's look at it. Let's look at publishing. If you open sourcing your own soft, software, obviously you're going to do that because you believe there's a higher impact and, and uh, typically there is. Um, what we tend to caution people is, uh, you know, no matter your, who you are, you, your brand, your position in, in the ecosystem today, uh, you're most likely to get lots and lots of interest uh, right after you open source something, uh, but don't get fooled or conned by that uh, because you have to make sure that you have a really solid bulletproof plan uh, to keep capturing that visibility and growing your community for at least the next 18 to 24 months. 24 months is what we tell people today. Right. You have to be the core driver of some of these initiatives for at least a couple of years. So that leads us to the cons here. It can be very expensive to open source some of your own software, and it can take lots of internal resources, not just the developers, but legal, security, marketing, uh, HR, procurement, and, and so on. So it, it does take a, it, it does take a, a big effort to, to be successful here. It's, we, there are some good examples out there, but it does take a, a big effort. Okay, so inner source. So we know that it, it can help drive, does drive innovation, and it does bring about internal cultural and organizational change. It does help an organization become a little bit more agile, um, <clears throat> a little bit more collaborative, um, but it is typically hard to accomplish, and it does take a long time. Because remember, we're talking about the enterprise here, not a single not just one uh, developer group or one line of business, but we're talking about an enterprise. So to, to really promote this across an enterprise, it does take a bit of time. Okay. So um, this is a, an, an approach or a model. You wanna just keep taking the overall goal that you've identified. Again, it could be, as opposed to brand, uh, uh, brand enhancement, it could be reducing costs. Uh, or driving more innovation um, as, the, as the higher level goals. But you can, the idea here is to apply this approach to break it e each step down a little bit more into its constituent parts until you get here. And then again, this, this is where you begin to apply very specifically your own organization's characteristics or capabilities. Some organizations have uh, you know, more developers they can apply to these efforts. They may have more budgets, some have, have less. Uh, some are already are down this, uh, this organizational cultural transformation path. So it's a little bit easier to say drive uh, inner source more enterprise wide. Um, and so this is where you really have to apply your own context 
to this particular approach and model. So want to wrap up with just a few tips uh, that, that uh, I've, I've um, uh, have generated through the, the work I've done over the years. Uh, and these are really, really ones that are important to the success of open source across the enterprise. Okay, so <clears throat> please take these, these with a degree of, of seriousness. So engage the right stakeholders early on in the process at all levels. So understand, it's important to actually understand who am I going to need to not only get this plan done, get the resources to, uh, to get signed off on this plan, to get the resources to execute this plan, to get the resources to actually uh, uh, support uh, the, the outcome of this strategy. Um, and think about you know, the functional groups, also HR procurement, legal, so on, uh, and get them engaged early in the process. Really, really important. All right. Engage everyone in the community itself. This may seem a bit, uh, a bit counterintuitive for some of what we call the functional operational groups, such again as HR legal procurement, um, but it's important to get them engaged. And the ways to do that are obviously get them involved in the, in the planning process, have them experience the community, have them participate on, on events like this, have them um, participate in users groups. Uh, there are even, uh, whether there, there are a whole bunch of users groups are, out there that aren't just developer oriented. There are some that there's a you know, legal open source community. There is a community loosely tied to procurement and security. Uh, but try and get everyone engaged in the process. It really helps smooth the decision-making uh, uh, process here. And very, very importantly, don't skimp on governance. Governance, um, you know, my definition of, of governance is simply the open source lifecycle component management, which includes, again, how you ingest, you know, policies and processes and automation and tooling that help manage open source from how it's ingested and acquired, how it's governed. So how are you validating security issues? How are you validating licensing and IP potential issues or conflicts? Um, how are you uh, managing uh, a version proliferation? How are you managing production support and so on? Um, address this early in the process. It's, you know, no one wants to do governance. You do governance because you want to get at the actual benefits of open source, right? Cost reduction, innovation, whatever the case is. But it's really important to have a sound foundation here. Can't stress this uh, enough. Uh, most enterprises are using five, 10,000 or more open source components and you can't manage that effectively uh, without without automation and without policies and processes. So please, if anything, pay attention to that piece, get that right as early in this process as possible. And then I like to say, you know, tell yourself or recognize that this is hard, but it will be worth it. And tell yourself that as many times as you need to. So thank you for, for joining me today. I am happy to answer any questions. I I'm not able to see them. So uh, Emily, if there are any questions, uh, please uh, let me know. Andrew, we don't have any questions just yet, but we'll stay on a few more minutes and see what comes in. Okay. All right. Okay, well, um, hopefully uh, the fact that there are no questions means that this was a very simple and straightforward process, something that you'll be able to, to apply as you go through your own uh, planning exercises here. Uh, I'll be on the, the uh, event Slack channel in a little bit and, and happy to answer any questions there or, or please feel free to, to reach out to me directly.
Thank you, Andrew. There's a, a number of thank yous and congrats. Interesting mm -hmm. and really useful insight. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. And I, I do appreciate your time today.